All right, welcome everybody to week uh, 13, day one, if anyone's still counting. We're going to get into uh, the topic of uh, set theory today, and uh, that's always a fun and very useful topic as well. Very important in computer science, but um, also um, uh, comes up a lot in uh, argumentation and debate, these other things we've talked about sort of it's sort of foundational for a lot of uh, for a lot of different things so let's go ahead and get into it so a set what is a set um, it's almost um, it's almost so vague and so broad a, a, a definition that it almost is kind of almost too vague to at first wrap your mind around it's it's a collection of anything right um i i could i could have a set called um bob and i could define the set as all computers in america or um all logitech speakers made between 1990 and 2003 like there's um, very few restrictions on um, how you can make a set and how you can uh, define if something is in a set or not. Oftentimes you just do it in English. If you're uh, taking like my discrete math class, then we get into more formal definitions of a set and um, things like that. But for this class, just understand like, you know, for every object in the world, um, something's either in the set or it's on the set okay so if i say <clears throat> you know i i uh, i have a set named i don't know tomas and uh it's a set of all uh books that have blue on their cover in the world right now like i don't even know how how big the set is right but i can tell you you know if i've got a book right here that, um, you know, this Make Electronics book has blue on the cover. It's in the set. Uh, this Maker's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse, not on the set. No blue on it. Okay. So, um, you know, usually when we're dealing with mathematics, we have a very formally defined set. The set of all integers, bigger than five, you know, Things like that. But you can, you know, kind of de describe a, a set however you want. Um, a set is that which can be said of a thing, such as the following axiom is satisfied. If that which is said of a thing is true, the thing is an element of the set, and the set is said to contain the thing. Yeah. Or else. Right. So you got, you got a predicate, right? A predicate is um, like a truth function. We talked about this in the Zy books. Um, and so if the truth function is true for that object like it, it does have blue on the cover then it is a member of the set okay. so um for every object in the world it's either in the set or not in the set and that's uh unless we get into like fuzzy set theory and things like that where there's partial membership but we're going to talk about boring basic set theory in this class uh terminology wise we use that uh, Curly boys, curly braces to denote sets. Um, and the things inside of the curly braces are called the elements of a set. So that's a term. That's a new term, set. And that's a term, element. Elements are members of a set. So if we have a, a, a set called the set of all models of cars made by Chevy, Chevrolet in 1981, then is this car here a member of that set? The, uh, the set that I just defined is all cars made by Chevrolet in 1981. Is this car here a member of that set?
Technically, I guess no, because like if it's an eighty-one, it was made in eighty. But you know, <laughs> that'd be a really mean question to ask on the on the midterm, right? Right? Because if you if you buy a two thousand and twelve, you know, car, it was made in two thousand eleven. Usually, that's a little that's a little too tricky. So yeah, that 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 would be a member of the set, right? That that was actually the first car that I drove. Uh, my grandfather uh, found an old woman in his retirement community that. Um, had a spare Chevy Citation for sale. He bought it off her for 500 bucks and gave it to me. And uh, worth every penny. <laughs> uh, let's just say that um, if you name your uh, if you name your car after a parking ticket, um, <laughs> it's it's a sign. Seems like a dope first car. Like, you know, it honestly wasn't that bad, but like, um, man, that car worked out a lot. And yeah, this is not, not a, like, like for one thing, um, the, the old woman, apparently every time she did groceries, she would stuff the plastic bags from the grocery store under the seat. I didn't know this. So I was driving down the freeway with the windows down and all of a sudden, the wind caught the plastic bags beneath the seat and they all started blowing around on the inside of the car. And there's no power windows on this thing. Oh, hell no. There are no power windows in this car. And so I have the windows down and there's like this tornado of like plastic bags, like all flying around inside of the thing on, on the freeway. I'm doing like 75 or whatever. And I'm like, like things are hitting me in the face and yeah, good times, good times. Okay. What about this guy? The 81 Chevy Camaro. Put a performance intake, straight pipe, repaint it, remove weight, turbo, bam, great car. I, I don't know about great car, but okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this, this would also be uh, a member of that set, right? All cars made in 81 by Chevy. Um, all right. So, um, if I said the set of all brown cars, you know, that would be in it and that wouldn't be, you know what I mean? It's being kind of, you know, very informally, we can just kind of define a set kind of however we want and something's either in it or, or not in it. And that's, that's about all there is to be said about that. Um, what, what is it? <laughs> That's a nice color on the car. This one, I don't know. Or this one, the kind of light blue. Which which one, Katie? Do you, do you like the uh, the brown on the Citation or the light blue on the, the Camaro? Camaro, yeah. Um, so, more formally though, we, we typically... Um, we typically use letters for some reason to define a set. We don't have to. Like I said, you can call it, you know, Michael or Pablo or Eric or whatever, you know, like whatever you want. And by the way, those are all the names of my friends that were former students. And so I just name things after them. And like on the, I don't know, on the midterm, I think I named stuff after them. And so I just screenshot it and post it to them on Discord. And they, get a, they get a kick out of that. Um, yeah, so... Um, Z, by the way, is, uh, is all integers. Um, what is an integer? An integer is a whole number. So, uh, is, yeah, well, um, we got a little bit more terminology here. Um, but is five an integer? What do you guys think? Is five an integer? Is five a whole number? Yeah. Okay. What about negative? That's a weird looking negative. What about negative seven? Is negative seven an integer also? Is it a whole number also? Yes. So what we would say is negative seven is an element of Z. And we, we use this weird um, 
eaty looking thing. I don't know if that has a name or not. It's probably got a name. Math people love coming up with weird names for stuff. I don't I don't think it's Epsilon. I think it's kind of its own thing. Um and so what about what about negative eight point one? Is that part of Z? Yeah, so uh, integers is both positive and negative, right? Uh, there, there is actually what you'd call Z positive and Z negative, if you want to be more specific. So negative 7 is an element of Z negative, and 5 is an element of Z positive. You want to go there. Yeah, so negative 8.1, negative 8.1 is not an element of Z. So another way I would read that in English is just eight, negative 8.1 is not an integer, right? Like that's that's literally what we mean when we define things, right? Like when you define something, like if I if I define, uh, uh, you know, you know what we talked about earlier, uh, Hispanic people are people whose ancestry derives ultimately from Spain. Then um, you know when, when you say so, like uh, you know Michael is Hispanic then that means Michael's ancestry is ultimately derived from Spain, at least a part of it, right? And so that's literally what we mean when we say something is something. In, in English, is is ambiguous, right? Because we could say like, banana is a fruit, and that means banana is an element of fruit, right? Where's my mouse? Where's Banana is a fruit, right? You guys understand? So, so we use is is a to mean it's like an element of something, but also um, we use it for like um, like equivalents, right? Like um, uh, my daughter is a good kid, right? Like saying so. Um, you know, the, the word is in the English language is a little, uh, could be a little ambiguous sometimes. And so uh, a lot of times in the world of mathematics, we like using these weird looking symbols and stuff like that instead. Um, don't worry about this for now, but okay. So this here is also a set, right? So C includes Bob and includes 6.2 and four and 11 times i, i is the square root of negative one, includes negative 52. Uh, so you can just define a set like however you want. Like, you know, nobody's, there's no set police that's gonna come and stop you, you know? Um, that said, um, there's a famous paradox that we'll, we'll talk about. If, you, if you're not too careful, you can run into contradiction, right? Because in, in critical thinking, the, the big no-no is contradiction, right? Don't you know, so is that three rules now we have for, uh, three rules now we have for, for critical thinkers, right? Uh, critical thinking, question everything, pros and cons, and uh, three, no contradiction, right? If you say, uh, if you enunciate some sort of principle, you know, don't don't contradict yourself on it. Okay. So uh, everything in the universe uh, is either in the set or not in the set. Yep. So um, yeah, that's that's what makes up a set, it's, it, and it can't be in twice. Uh, no duplicates, right? Right. So either seven is in the set of integers or it's not in the set of integers, but you can't like add it twice, right? Because it doesn't make sense. Like, it's just in. It's in the set. Do you guys understand? Like, um, you can't add the number seven multiple times to integers. It's just, it's in the set. Do you guys understand that? What I mean by no duplicates, it's like, um, like if I went around and tallied up all the cars um, if I've already got um, this Chevy Citation written down, I don't need to write it down a second time. I'd be like, all right, 
cars, models, like if I was doing models made by Chevy, right? And, I'm, and I just go through the uh, DMV's records and I just index all the cars in California. Um, and, and I find a Chevy citation, I add it to the list. I find another Chevy citation, I don't need to add it to the list again. It's like, it's already in the list. There's already got that one. So you, you don't, you, you're not going to see Chevy citation listed five times. We already got that model. Just ignore it. Ignore the duplicates. Only one copy of each element. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Okay. And so here is um, kind of what we're going to be talking about a lot today. And I have, uh, like, if you saw the practice midterms, I like having questions on this, which is, how big is a set? How many different elements of a set are there? How many different models of car did Chevy make in 1981? Right? And we represent that with the absolute value bars. So if you guys uh, remember absolute value from algebra, um, negative 5, absolute valued is 5, right? That's not what this means. <laughs> it's all this means when you when you put the absolute value bars around a set then um, you're asking how many elements in that set are there so how many elements are in five or are, are in five well there <laughs> it's a very tough question I asked how many elements are in C five <laughs> right one two three four five right so you just count them like oh, there's five you know uh, if uh, sometimes it can be more tricky, right? Like how many how many different models of car did Chevrolet make in 1981? Then you gotta like um, I don't even know if we can figure that out. Can we figure that out? Models of cars made in 1981 by Chevrolet. Let's see if there's a List of Chevrolet vehicles. Okay, there is a Wikipedia page for it. Um, hmm, past models. Hmm. There's the citation right there. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so I guess you can just go through here and just kind of count how many different models there are. Um, maybe like Kelly Blue Book or something. Hmm figured out that way let's find out how much a 1981 Chevy citation is worth today <laughs> negative probably negative Kelly and Blue Book volumes year oh, it doesn't even go back that far <laughs> okay let's go back to 1992 let's find out how many cars are made by Chevrolet in 1992 model one two three and you go through and just count you know what I mean count uh so yeah, let's look at the Camaro, I guess. 92 Camaro with 200,000 miles on it. And zip code of 93730. What category is it? Uh, regular. I hope it doesn't do one of those, like, please enter your email address to get the quote. I always hate those websites. Uh, <laughs> $600, yeah, sounds about right. Okay. So, yeah, you can, uh, some, sometimes figuring out how big a set is a little more involved, right? Like, you gotta open up a web page and, like, look at some, look at some things like that. Um, how many... Um, what is the size of the set of people in this class? It's going to be like GameStop when you trade in games that give you $10 for it. Man, if they gave me $10 for my old games, I'd love it. It's always like, oh, Super Mario Odyssey, we'll give you a dollar twenty-three. Best they can do. <laughs> and then they wonder why they're going out of business. You are not going to get something on the midterm where you have to Google something. No, no, absolutely not. I'm just showing you, like, in general, 
because set theory is related to a lot of different concepts. It's, it's a, it's actually the foundations for mathematics in general. All math ultimately drives from set theory, from something called ZFC th set theory. But also, perhaps more relevant for me as a computer science major, um, have you guys ever heard of like a database? Has ever heard of a database? Like uh, companies have databases of customers and things like that. Um, pretty much every company of any size, right? Like maybe not your local mom and pop, you know, shawarma place or something like that. But um, pretty much any company of any size is going to have a database that tracks all of their data, right? So, yeah, it has all the information the company has, like uh, who's working for them, um, what contracts they have open, uh, what their customers, who their customers are, you know, so like uh, my martial arts studio that I go to, they have um, a database of um, all the students who do martial arts there and their waivers are all scanned in and on file. And if somebody hasn't shown up for martial arts in a while, then they... You know, the, prior to the pandemic, they'll call them like, hey, we miss you. Where are you? You know, um, it's a little weird the first time they do that, but, you know, it works. You're like, okay, I'll, I'll be in tonight, you know. And literally any company of any size is going to have a database. And a lot of times that will require a professional person or team of people to maintain that database and to do queries on the database, right? And database stuff in general is set theory. <laughs> it's just set theory. Like literally what you're doing is you're typing in, you know, find all, you know, find all customers, um, you know, who haven't been here, who the last time they've been here is over two weeks, you know, and they'll, that's called a query. You pull data out. And then you can say email all email all customers on this list and send this letter filling in the name here. Hey, we miss you. Where have you been? Um, guilt trip, guilt trip, guilt trip. And then the system will spam emails to all the customers so you don't have to do them one at a time. And then you can also query people that haven't been there in four weeks and you give them a call, you know, personally. So uh, databases are... Like if you want to just like get a job and like be comfortable for the rest of your life, learn databases. Uh, it took me a day to learn them. Uh, they're not really that hard. And the the really interesting thing about it is that um, they're in huge demand. Like um, I helped Fresno Pacific University set up their computer science program, their software engineering program. And um, I sat on their advisory committee for it. And um, the guy who, who was setting it up, who's now teaching at Readly, he teaches uh, computer science at Readly now. Real cool, real cool dude. Like him a lot. Um, he was asking the industry people, like, "Hey, um, what do you guys need here in Fresno? Like, we're we're going to be training people in computer science. What do you guys need? Like, what skills are you looking for when you want to hire people out of?" Us, you know, and the number one thing was databases. The, no, the number one thing was we need, we can't find enough people in the, in the Fresno area that do database stuff. And um, in order to do database stuff, you have to understand set theory. So, you know, if you if you want a job, you know, um, decently paying job, if you know how to do database stuff, you can get a job basically anywhere in the world. Because, like I said, every company of any size needs a database person. You know. Um, when I was in high school, just the fact that I had had some experience with databases, and this was before I like actually formally learned this stuff and um, actually learned SQL and all this other stuff, I had just done databases. Like I was, um, uh, I was the treasurer for Key Club Kiwanis in, in high school, and uh, so I was doing all this kind of database stuff, just very informally kind of stuff, and I got a job offer, like as a senior in high school, like. Don't go to college. We'll pay you sixty-five thousand a year, and just come work for us. And 
you know, we'll t- you, you, you know, you, you seem good and what you do and come work for us and we'll train you and you know, sky's the limit, you know? And I, I turned it down because I, I really wanted to go to college, you know, uh, you know, stuff like that. But if I had wanted to with absolute, you know, really a little experience, but not even uh, almost enough to count, I could have had a job at the age of 17 for 65,000 a year. And that's in 1995 money, not modern money, right? There's probably been a bit of inflation since then, but yeah. Like here in Fresno, I think, uh, like 65K, it's probably around actually where it is. Yeah, here in, here in town for those kinds of jobs. But that was that was in San Diego, and San Diego obviously has more, you know, salaries because it's ridiculously expensive to get a house in San Diego. Right? Um, experience is always more sought after than a piece of paper. Yeah, it's true also. Okay, so this thing here, the size of a set, do you guys understand it? So if I ask you how big a set is, you can just count, right? That makes sense? The, the absolute value things. Like if I uh, give you a set of the numbers from one to 10 and ask you how big is it, I would put, it's like if I define a set named uh, Q and Q is the set of all numbers from one to 10. What is the size of Q? Q is the numbers from one to 10. What is the size of Q? What is the cardinality of the set? Ten. Okay. What if I made it? Uh, this is something that always gets people in computer science because in computer science we start counting from zero a lot. What if I made it from zero to ten? How many numbers are there from zero to ten? <clears throat> Eleven. Yeah. In computer science, we usually start counting from zero. And so, uh, zero to 10, oh, it must be 10 numbers. 10 minus, 10 minus zero is 10. So, <laughs> gotta be careful. That's called an off by one error. And it's very common. It's a very common bug in computer science. Okay, so let's do some examples. Um, first of all, if two, if two uh, sets of the same cardinality, like if you can make a, a one-to-one and on-to function between two different sets they're the same size you see that there's five leopards and five sheep and you can kind of draw a, if you can make some sort of one-to-one relationship between each of the elements in the set they're the same size so that's useful sometimes like um if you know how many different models of chevrolet cars there are and and you can find that on wikipedia or something and let's say that Chevrolet had a rule that there, for every model of car, there's exactly one designer. Maybe you can't find a list of the designers, but because you know there's exactly one designer for every one model of car, then if there were 37 models of cars, there were 37 designers. Does that make sense? Like if, if you know there's a one-to-one relationship from one set to another set, you can figure out what the size of the other set is from the size of the first set. Kind of common sense, I think. So, all right, um, the complement of a set, there's a lot of terminology today. And this is our, like I said, this is our next kind of big topic, um, is uh, the that exponent C kind of thing. Like a lot of people think this is like in algebra where like you take it to the fifth power. No, 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 no. That's not what that means. If, um, if uh, we have, let's see, um, um, let's say that we've got uh, C, which is all students in this class. All right. Now let's say that uh, we have S, which is uh, all students in C with an S in their name. Okay, so um, uh, Ramses, you're in the S set, 
um, Arias is, Sanchez is, Mitchell Bibb, you're not, right? So, uh, so let's say that we have, I'm just going to make up numbers here. Let's say we've got uh, 90 people in the class and the number of students with S in their name is, I don't know, 30, right? And so, uh, <clears throat> so the complement of a set is everything in the universe not in the set. So in this case, the universe is going to be the class, let's say. And so the size of the complement is going to be 60, right? <clears throat> so uh, everybody who does not have an S in their name, right, would be 60 students. Okay. And we write that with a, like a, it looks like, again, it looks like a power, like S to the seeth power. That's not, it just means complement. Okay. And it's with a, it's complement with an E, not an I. That's to compliment somebody. <laughs> the complement means everybody not in the set. Okay. So if E is all the even numbers and integers, the complement of E is all the odd numbers, right? So um, two, four, six are even numbers. The complement is everything that is not two, four, six, eight, et cetera. It's the odd numbers. So um, be another example um, uh, if I have if the universe is you know all the books on my bookshelf right now then uh, that maker's guide to electronics and the makers uh, um, the maker's guide to the zombie apocalypse and the make electronics books are in that set however um, this book down here on the ground is not in the set because it's not on the bookshelf and so that's so I have a set of books on the bookshelf and I've got the complement, which is everything not on the bookshelf. Reminds me of math one, one functions. Yeah. All right. There is something called the empty set. Uh, the empty set is written like this. Do you see how there's a slash through that circle? That means there is nothing in the set. Okay, this is the number zero, <laughs> right? Zero can be like zero is an element. It's it's you know zero is an element of z, right? It's it's an element of e. E is um, all even numbers, right? Zero is an even number, right? So we would write you know zero is an element of e, and zero is an element of z. It's an integer, right? This is not zero. This is not zero. If you write something with a slash, the zero with a slash through it, that means the set is empty, right? So if I ask you for um, all whole numbers not in Z, right? If I ask you for uh, the set, if I define D as uh, all whole numbers not in Z, in other words, all whole numbers that aren't integers, then we write this as that. Yep. That means it's empty. There's nothing in, in the set. Or you can write it sometimes just like that as well. You guys understand? It's not zero. It's not zero. That's the null character. The null character. It means there's nothing in the set. All right, because there are no whole numbers not in Z. Uh, is that also the symbol for undefined? Um, is a subset of all sets. Yeah, technically, the null set is a subset of every set. Right? Um, are null and undefined different? Um, in set theory, I don't know if there's such a thing as undefined, but yeah, you'd, you'd probably see that that symbol used in in other contexts. Sure. So. Null is a zero with a slash symbol through the middle. Yeah, exactly. Right. So there's the old Irish pub background wallpaper engine. That back there is called a snug. A snug is um, like a little private booth where people can have a conversation in private. Okay. Um,
So if um, so if we're in Z6, Z6, by the way, means the first six integers, which is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And if we define A to be the first four of these, right, that's A there, then the complement of it is the other two, right? And so the size of A is 4, the size of A complement is 2. Does that make sense to you guys? Like we're just doing a lot of definitions and terminology today. The actual, none of it's hard. The hard thing is just, you're, you're gonna have a bunch of symbols thrown at you, right? It's like the first time you see a, a, a peach emoji, you're like, what the hell does that mean? You know, and after you're like, oh. I get it, it's not hard. Um, well, the first time you see something, what the hell does that mean? Yeah. So, any questions about the terminology so far? So, we would say four. Four is an element of a complement, right? Any questions about what we've talked about so far? Like I said, if you, if you guys pay attention to this and you like don't want to go to college, <laughs> what, my college professor is encouraging us not to, not to go to college? <laughs> no, it's just, you know, just tossing that out there, you know. There's, there's a lot of jobs available. So. Uh, is this all, is this about all the terminology we need to know? Uh, not quite, not quite. There's uh, about three or four more things. I'm just checking in with you now. All right, so the next thing is the Wicked character. Have any of you guys played Croquet? Um, croquet is a game where you have like a, you have like a little hammer like this, and you have like a ball, and there's like wickets. You like hit the, hit the ball through the wicket. See you, Kenji. Good luck on your vaccine. I remember relax your shoulder. If you tense up, then it damages the shoulder. So just make sure your, your muscles are nice and relaxed when they chap you. Now it's hard to say <laughs> it's gonna hurt me. You know, just try to try to keep it relaxed. And it'll it'll make it go a lot smoother. Haven't heard of that game in so long. Yeah, it was popular back in the day, but um it's a fun it's a fun it's a fun game. Uh, I played it with my my daughter the first time over spring break and Kicked your ass at it. I mean, you know, I don't mean to brag, but kicked your ass. Okay. Um, so this is the wicket character, uh, and it and it means intersection. So if we have A, which is one, two, three, and four, and B is three, four, five, six, seven, what does intersection mean? Intersection set intersection means give me everybody that's in both sets. It's the equivalent of and. Right in logic, in truth tables, we've been talking about and capital and. Um, so we go through here, and for each element in each set, we say, is it in both of them? And so is one in both sets? Nope. Two, three, up. Oh, three is and four is. Okay. Five's not. Six not. Seven's not. So the intersection of A and B is all of the elements that are in both. You guys see that? Yeah, if you, if you get a chance, like they usually sell like big five and things like that. And like, if you just have a, it, it's a six player game. You just set up on a lawn somewhere, you go to a park, and just set up. It's actually really fun. Uh, it's a mean game too. It's a mean game. It's like playing pool kind of, six player pool. And the rules are, if you can hit it through the wicket, you get another stroke, you get another hit. And if you don't hit it through, you just kind of set yourself up, then you're done at the next person's turn. But if they hit your ball, then they get two strokes. And, um, and they can hit your ball. And so, like, you're all set up to go through the wicket on the next one. They come over, tap you. The first hit, they just knock you across the playing field. And then they go through the, the, the wicket on the next one. It is a mean game. It is a mean game. You're playing teams or you're playing individually. It's fun, though. It's a lot of fun. It's golf for jerks, yeah. It's uh, PvP golf, really. That's what it is. It's fun. Um, 
Okay, so uh, the size of A is four, the size of B is five, the intersection is two, right? Because there's two elements, there's two elements in common with A and B. Um, anytime you take the intersection of something with its complement, you're gonna get the null set because everything in A is not in A complement, right? And the size of the null set is zero. There's no elements in the null set. Sounds fun, actually. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, my grandfather was mean. Like he would, he would hit you, and then he would hit you on the backside of the wicket. He would go through the wicket and hit you again, and knock you on the backside of the next wicket, and then go through and hit you again. And if you're good at the game, like you can just chain combo and just take somebody with you, and you end up like on the far side of the field, and he's halfway through the course on just one hit, you know, on his on one move. That's cool. You get a chance. The, the sets aren't very expensive at Big Five. Okay. So Union is the uh, anti-wicket. So it's a upwards facing wicket. After you're done playing croquet, you put the wicket facing upwards. Uh, or you can just think of that as Union, right? The upwards U. It's not a U though. If you look at that, that is a weird math symbol. But U for Union, pretty easy to remember, I guess. And union is like or, okay? So the union of A and B will put elements into the union if they're in either or set, right? If they're in A or they're in B, they get added to the, the set. Remember, there's no duplicates, right? So we're gonna add one, we're gonna add two, we're gonna add three, we're gonna add four, we come over here. We don't add three again, we don't add four again because they're already in. Right, but we had five, we had six, we had seven. And so the union of A and B is one through seven. Okay. If we have, um, I don't know, um, uh, the letters, yeah, let's do the set Q, which is, I don't know, we'll be doing letters. I'll add R and A and T. And the set Zoop is equal to cat, so to speak, C and A and T. By the way, you can write these sets in any order you want. So if zoop is equal to C and A and T, those three letters, then zoop is also equal to the American College Test, and it's also equal to some tactical year. Right? It's the same thing. Do you guys understand? Like, it doesn't actually matter what order you write a set in, because something is either in a set or not in a set. So you can kind of write it however you want. Um, so what is what is the intersection of Q and Zoop? What do you guys think? Q intersected with Zoop is what? I'm just gonna wait until you guys answer. It's not a hypothetical, it's not a dramatic pause. I'm actually waiting for you guys to do it. What is the intersection of Q and Zoop? Q is the letter R, the letter A, the letter T. Zoop is the letter C, the letter A, the letter T. Intersection, not union. Yep. So the intersection is A and T. Okay. So what is the union of Q and Zoop? What is, yeah, I got you. <laughs> what is the union of Q and Zoop? Our cat. Does it have to be written that way? What about cart. Write it that way too. Doesn't matter what order you write in. Um, 
probably a lot of people would probably alphabetize it A C R T. Really doesn't matter because either something's in the set or not. So if I ask you, is R in the set? Yes, it is. Whereas if you guys wrote it over here, R cat, yes, it is. It, it makes no difference which order you write it in. It's either in or it's not. So that is union. So union uh, is everybody that appears in either of the sets. It can be, appear in both. It can appear in one. It doesn't matter. Uh, the main thing to keep in mind is you don't add the AT twice, right? Because it's just in the set. So, um, yeah, you don't write C A R T A T you know, A A T T. No, it's, it, A's in the set, T's in the set. All right, and now I think the final. It's funny. Um, the final bit of terminology, final symbol is subset. Okay, so what have we learned today? How many different weird ass symbols have we seen today? We've seen the uh, element of, we've seen the absolute value, we've seen complement, um, a union B, a intersect B, uh, let's see what else. And, you know, just a uh, null set. Okay. So these are all the things we've learned today. Final thing, and we'll call it a day, is subset. So subset uh, means, is something a member of a set or not? And this is your kind of database query, right? Uh, you know, for, uh, it's a, like, uh, if you had a predicate or something, you know. Uh, uh, find me all um, customers that have not come into karate in, in two weeks, right? Uh, so subset is a true or false, okay? It's a true or false. And it looks like a wicket turned on its side. And so uh, this returns a set, and this returns a set. These two things return sets. Subset returns true or false, okay? So if I ask you is, um, so what, what does it mean? It means all, is it true that all elements of A are in B? So if I, if I had, um, if A was uh, one, two, three, four, and B is three and four, is it true that A is a subset of B? Does every element in A appear in B? Is A a subset of B? Or sub means smaller than. Um, is A a subset of B? Does every element of A appear in B? No. So this returns false. Is B a subset of A? Is B a subset of A? Does every element, that's a three, believe it or not. Uh, does every element of B appear in A? Yes. So this is true. So B is three and four, A is one, two, three, four. So three and four, yep. So B is a subset of A. And there's two different versions of subset. There's that one and there's that one. And you can think of this as less than or equal to and less than kind of. Um, for your usual subset, um, uh, A is actually a subset of A, right? Like A is technically a subset of A because every element of A appears in A. And so normally though, that's not what we mean, right? If I talk about the subset of humanity that uh, goes to Fresno State, uh, we typically are talking about a smaller group than the larger group, right? And so um, with if it doesn't have that line beneath it, that means proper subsets. That means it's actually smaller than in size. So B is also a proper subset of, of A. So we would write B is a proper subset of A. It is smaller than A. A is, a is a subset of A, but it's not a proper subset of A. It is not a proper subset of A because it's not smaller than A. And, and we typically, in English, when we use the word subset, we mean proper subset. Because uh, you know, if we're talking about a subset of humanity, we're talking about a smaller group. 
Um, and technically, humanity is a subset of humanity, which sounds really weird, <laughs> right? S humanity is a subset of humanity. Like, hmm? like usually, when we say subset, we mean like a smaller, a smaller group. So um, that's it for today. We just talked about terminology, but when you understand these concepts, you can start doing things like say, "All right, uh, find me, uh, do an intersection." Uh, I've got this customer database. I'm working for Lithia Nissan. I want you to, Mr. Database person, I want you to give me a list of customers that are over 50 years old, that make over $100,000 a year, that have bought a car from us before, and their car is over four years old. And so that's the intersection of the group of all customers, the group of, uh, sorry, the group of all customers over 50, the group of all rich customers, the group of all customers that have um, uh, cars that are over five years old, and that database query will give you a list of, I don't know, 100 names or so. And then uh, you can fire off a letter to each of them saying, hey, the new uh, 2013, you know, Nissans are in stock, you know, um, you know, whatever, you know, like the, um, you know, you send them off a letter and encourage them to, to come in and buy and, um yeah, um, that all that database stuff is set intersection, set union. Find all customers who either make over a hundred thousand a year or make under twenty thousand a year, because you get free banking if you're poor. Uh, you get free banking, and if you're rich, you get free banking. So, um, for different reasons, but either way, so find the union of all, you know, this and this, and and then send a letter letter off to them. And, it, and this this is the kind of thing that the businesses do all the time. So they hire people to do this because it's apparently hard. And, um, you know, your typical bank manager can't do a database query. So um, they will hire a database person. And they're reasonably well paid because for some reason not a lot of people can do this. But it's all based on these concepts. Union, intersection, complement, size of, you know, count how many... Count how many customers, <laughs> right, make over 100,000 a year, right? So if A was the set of all customers who make over 100,000 a year, then, uh, you know, absolute value bars around it is the number of customers that make over 100,000 a year. E means element of. So am I, am I element of that set? I don't know. Is there going to be a quiz and or a Zybox on this? Yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. Equal sets are mutually inclusive. Yeah, all, all sets are subsets of themselves. But like I said, that's kind of a weird thing. So, to, like to say in English. And so, a lot of times in English, when we say subset, we mean proper subset. And like I said, it's kind of like the relationship between less than or equal to and less than. Right? A, a is less than or equal to A. You know what I mean? Like, the size of A is less than or equal to the size of A. Um, but it's not less than. So... Um, And so uh, <laughs> the size of an infinite set is something called elephantal. We can talk about that next time. Um, I'll just I'll just leave leave this uh, amazing <laughs> homage to Pythagoras, Plato, Goethe, Nietzsche, Bergson, Bragdon, Gurdjieff, Kwapinski, Einstein, <laughs> the Logos, Analysis. Vishnu and Shiva, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I have no idea what's happening here. Uh, when do you start your GE portfolio? We'll talk about that soon. Um, but yeah, it'll. Uh, you will have to write an essay. Uh, that's sort of the capstone thing. It's like 10% of your grade in this class. Uh, you're going to have to write an essay for your GE uh, portfolio thing. And uh, yeah, we'll get to it. And then you'll submit it to the, the school's GE coordinator. So, yeah, this is how, uh, I don't know if that's like an orange in the middle or something. It looks like an orange. I'm not really sure what's happening there. Does every class have to do that? Uh, uh, this class. So if you take critical thinking at Fresno State, all of them mandate a essay on critical thinking. And uh, the discussions that we've been doing are kind of like a little bit of practice for that. Uh, but you're actually going to have to like write an essay. And so we'll, we'll, we'll go over that. 
So even if you weren't going to take this class, you would have to take the critical thinking general ed somewhere, philosophy maybe. And you would have to write that essay and submit it to the submit it to the GE coordinator. But no, you don't have to do this in every class. Like a, like computer science classes very rarely require you to write essays. That's a that's a seaside one thing. Right? Because we talk about social issues in computer science and fallacies and things like that. Higher level computer science you might be doing reports on like, is this faster than this? Stuff like that. But yeah, this kind of critical thinking thing, nope. <laughs> and it, quite possibly this might be the only time in your computer science career you'll actually talk about the social impact of computer science and algorithmic bias and things like that so you know um pay attention because <laughs> it's important you know it, it really is you know if, if you go off and work for tesla you know make sure you're you, you know you just think about you know different people and make sure we'll support them you know? as a tall person um you know you, you can tell when the people who, uh, you know, cut the trees aren't tall because the, the trees are like here and I'm walking down the sidewalk, like hunched over. It's like whoever cut it was like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm this tall, so I'll give a couple of more inches on it. And, you know, you, you can tell, you can tell when people don't think about you, you know, and, you know it's, it's not the end of the world, but, um, you know, just try to be thoughtful and considerate and, you know, you know, all right, that's it for today, guys. Thank you very much. And we will pick this up next time. How tall am I? Um, I am 198 centimeters. <laughs> if that helps, communism units help you. <laughs> All right, see you guys.